shiny faces here. Sweet. Um, okay. Um, awesome. Sounds like we got some more people hopping in. I'm going to do a little maneuvering real quick so if people hop on. If you guys want to have your cameras on, I'll be able to see you. We can chat. I promise I don't bite. I'd like to make things very conversational. Um, I see we're recording, so we're ready to rock, correct, Will? Yep. All good to go. Awesome. Well, thank you, all of you, for joining us this evening. Um, my name is Gino DeRose, and I work with Ian J. Gallo Winery um, with our sales and leadership team in Southern California, but I work specifically with the recruiting team um, focus on our college recruiting efforts in Southern California. So really excited to connect with you all this evening and talk a little bit more about selling yourself in a virtual age and how do we plan for our careers virtually and what does that really look like now today. So we'll leave you guys with some best practices on digital networking, how to sell yourself, what are we really trying to highlight. Um, we also do have some opportunities for those that are juniors maybe looking for a summer sales internship. Um, and then we also do have full-time post-grad opportunities for those that may be looking for some opportunities to follow college. So I'll make sure to plug those at the end for you all, um, but we'll go ahead and dive right into the content. So I think when we think about selling yourself virtually, the first thing that we really got to reflect upon is what is our plan? So I think there's a couple steps that we should be taking in our careers um, early on to try and kind of figure out what that is. And so the first is really going to be relying on self-discovery, really learning about who we are. So everything from our interests, I would say both professionally, but personally too. So um, for myself, like, yes, I want to be able to work in teams. I want to be able to um, inspire others. I would love to have managerial roles where I can still leadership and responsibilities and others, but other interests out of mine, like wine and spirits and sports and all those types of things too. So how can I marry those two together is a lot of those conversations that we have. When we look at skills, what are those skills that you possess today? also being aware of what are those skills that I maybe need to gain for something that I'm interested in. So how can we work on that skill development? Um, identifying our types of personalities. If we are an introvert and we don't want to be working directly with customers, going and working in an outside sales role where you have to go talk to people all day is probably not the best decision because it just doesn't align with your personality and that's completely okay. But I think just being aware of that. And then last but certainly not least for self-discovery are values and what do we hold true to ourselves and why is that important to us? being aware of those types of things. After we've kind of gone through that self-discovery process, we're then gonna move into exploration. So trying to learn more about um, reading about certain types of jobs, conducting informational interviews with employers. So um, maybe not sitting down and having that formal interview to talk about your experiences and why you're the best fit candidate, but rather do it the opposite side. Sit down with the recruiter, get to ask them questions about the company, the organization, et cetera. Um, looking into job shadowing. So there's a lot of organizations that recruit at USC that you can do some job shadowing opportunities and that'll give you exposure in a certain industries to make sure it's something that you're interested in, but also make sure that that is a right fit for you. Um, getting involved with clubs and organizations on campus is a great way to explore different industries, but also different skill sets that you can develop now. Internships, volunteer work, USC offers an immense different types of courses. So take those classes to learn more about industries. Sometimes that job that you hated doing is the best for you to learn in because that's where you're the most uncomfortable and that's where you're gonna learn the most about yourself and also learn that maybe this just wasn't for me. And then also for students, I always recommend maybe consider graduate school or professional school if that's something that you're really interested in and you wanna continue that education. As we've kind of explored and learned more about maybe an industry or a role, maybe now we're gonna focus on that skill development. So again, taking those classes, seeking those industry specific internships, um, joining clubs that can focus on the skills that are gonna help you be successful in that role when applying for it, um, volunteering in certain industries, job shadow, and then looking for those work industry relative experiences. Um, so for an example, like sales. For sales, you gotta learn how to sell yourself and oftentimes sell a product or a service. And so you're working with customers directly. So maybe even something sales focused or even working in restaurant service is gonna help you develop skills that are transferable to that industry. So think about those transferable skills as well. And then the last process is gonna be that job search. So networking with employees, which we'll get to, looking out for specific companies, and we'll talk about how are some ways that we can target those, doing research on the jobs, um, creating your resume, your cover letter, and we'll talk about some of those main things to highlight. And then actually going through the application, interviewing, and then going into that negotiation offer. And so we'll break those down today too. So I think that first thing when we break down um, the early phases, what do you care about? 
So there's a lot of different things that we can care about when looking into an organization. Um, some of those things being the company values, making sure that that aligns with what your values are personally. The compensation and the benefits. For some people, maybe you have family members or children and you wanna make sure that you have benefits that can support them as well. Or maybe you're really focused on having that highest opportunity for a salary and you want that high compensation. Other people are looking for career advancement, so growth in an organization. And then other people, maybe they're really focused on diversity and inclusion and looking for those initiatives in an organization because that's important to a lot of our generation. Sustainability, as we get into these elections and talk about sustainable business practices and making sure that we preserve our environment. What is the organization that you're doing, that you're working with doing today? Training and development opportunities in that organization. Um, having an interest in that industry. You work 40, 50, 60 hours in a week when you are in a career. Um, and you want to be interested in what you do, because if not, you're going to get burnt out very quick. And then the last is personal growth. So how can you grow in an individual? So I really encourage you all to think about these types of qualities. Think about these, um, I guess, values or what you stand for and why you would want this in an organization and what is the most important to you. After we've identified what's the most important, now we got to really explore the industries and organizations. So get familiar with those industries whether it's the roles, whether it's the companies, the leaders or professionals in it, utilize LinkedIn and these other networking sites to reach out and connect with them. And we'll talk about some best practices around that. Uh, but a great way to get your foot in the door is leaning in on networking events on campus, attending those events and connecting with those professionals and following up by trying to set up an informational interview. Um, if they have opportunities to shadow a role like we talked about, you can go and shadow a job for a day or a week or however long their timeline is and get more familiarity with what that would look like working for the company. Volunteer work, a great way for you to get involved. Sometimes maybe the organization doesn't have the compensation opportunity to offer you an internship. So maybe you volunteer for a couple of days to get the experience. Those internship opportunities. And then last but not least, joining clubs that pertain to the industry, whether on campus um, or locally in your communities too. As we talk about some of the ways that we can develop our leadership skills now, um, the first is getting involved on campus. So I always tell students to join clubs, join organizations, whether it's um, professional, social, student government, um, debate team. You see a list of them right there in that first column. There's a multitude of different ways that you can get involved on campus, just like joining transfer student community and getting involved on in the leadership teams and developing skills that can be transferable, like effective communication, being able to inspire others, um, being able to be adaptable, organization skills, all skills that'll help you in any industry that you're interested in. Um, getting involved off campus too. So we talked about volunteer work, internships, part-time jobs. Um, maybe it's a hobby that you pick up or music or arts. Again, giving yourself the opportunity to get involved. And I would say, don't be afraid to take on different and multiple responsibilities. Um, because you're really going to be able to find your niche by being involved in a lot of these different areas of campus on and off. As we talk about trying to set yourself up for success, so this is something that we take a lot of pride in at Gallo. Has anyone heard of SMART goals previously, for those of you that I have on the call? Yes. Will has awesome, and I see some head shaking. So I'll break it down for some of you that aren't familiar with it. So SMART goals is a metric that I found that once I realized how to set a SMART goal, it really made all the difference when trying to plan for your future or whatever task you're trying to achieve. So the first part of it is going to be specific. So being specific to what that goal is. So for an example, um, maybe your specific goal is connecting with five recruiters via LinkedIn to um, schedule informational interviews. So we're specific to what we're trying to achieve at that task is scheduling informational interviews. Next would be making it measurable. So not leaving it too open-ended, we're gonna get it a little bit more specific um, and being measurable with it too. So we said five informational interviews for this example. So it gives us a metric to work towards. Oftentimes we find in early goal setting stages in our careers, we leave them a little too open-ended um, and then it's kind of too broad and it's just kind of daunting and looming and we keep pushing it off. So if you set a measurement, it gives you something to work towards. What I would say is, is it attainable? Is it something that can actually be attained in your means? So um, can you go out and actually achieve this? Realistic, is it realistic in what you can actually do? So for an example, like if we're trying to schedule or achieve an interview or an internship or a full-time post-grad opportunity, if we don't have any experience in the industry, we're probably not gonna be able to apply for the CEO level to start. We gotta be realistic with ourselves in that time. 
And that's an important part about our goal setting. And then timely, this is I think the portion that we all drop off of our goals the most often is giving ourselves a date to work towards. So um, whether it's by a certain date, give yourself a week, two weeks, a month, I would say just don't make it too broad to where you're saying by the end of the year and you're giving yourself four months to just schedule four informational interviews. Have a little bit of sense of urgency and work towards a specific time. As we talk about now getting noticed. So I think the first part is just getting out there. And we'll talk about how to get it out there now. But although it's virtual, we really got to put our best effort forward to go out and connect with recruiters. It's not as easy for us to just be on campus and go and hop into a networking event and be able to meet up with recruiters because we were leading class. We really got to put our best effort forward as students now. Don't be afraid to ask questions. So anything about the industry, the company, the organization, but also what makes a successful candidate? What makes a successful hire? And those are great ways for you to get an idea of what can you be working on now. So when you can apply for that position, you have those qualifications under your belt. Um, the Trojan network on campus is incredible. You guys have one of the best alumni, alumni networks across the states. Um, so really lean in on that network. Use your um, peers, use your professors, use the Career Center to connect you with professionals to get your foot in that door. It's all about steaming out and being able to have a connection or um, to start is really going to help that opportunity. Be aware of nonverbal communication. So we'll get to that in a bit. But I think even though we're virtual, still acting interested, making eye contact, etc. And then be specific with examples to back up your resume. So oftentimes we kind of lean in on the resume to kind of sell ourselves. But really, the resume should be there to kind of talk about what we learned and what our roles kind of entailed. And now we're here to reinforce that too. So be able to back up those with specifics. So now transitioning to some networking and how do we professionally network and eventually set ourselves up to sell ourselves. First is going to be through digital or online because that's the world that we live in today. Um, Instagram or Facebook. No, I'm not saying go and reach out to that recruiter through Instagram and send them a DM. Uh, but a great way for you to learn more about different industries, different companies, um, different employees in that organization. As we talk about really looking for that self-discovery, this is a great way for you to do a little bit of research to learn about certain industries. The email is going to be our main source of where we're kind of doing that outreach. But so my main point here is just keep it professional. I know when I was younger, I had like an email that was like soccer kid one, two, three, like update those to our professional emails. We want to give off a professional representation of ourselves. And then last but not least is LinkedIn. And so I won't spend too much time on this because I got a couple slides on it. But make a LinkedIn. If you don't have one, that is my first piece of advice to follow up with is go and make a LinkedIn for yourself. Face to face. So it doesn't happen in person today. We live in the Zoom era and it's a little different, but you still have opportunities to connect with professionals face to face. So I'd say first and foremost, have your cameras on when you're at events. It really helps you stand out, whether it's group events um, or one on ones. You should always try to lean in on having your camera turned on. Um, for those group events, you can really make connections, come with questions, stay interested, stay curious. A lot of your professors, you have personal connections with family and friends, and even your current company or past employers, they can connect you with people one-on-one -on -one too. So reach out to them and schedule those times to connect with professionals. And then kind of highlighting some best practices around <laughs> digital. So first and foremost is going to be social media. My advice is keep it clean, keep it professional. Uh, if you have a question, you probably shouldn't post it. Um, my advice is if you don't want your mom, your grandmother, and your professor on Monday to see it, don't post it on social media. If you have to go onto your Instagram and turn on all the different parameters so your mom and certain people can't see the post, just don't post it. The only reason I say that is, yes, I know that sometimes it may not be that bad, but you don't want that one stupid mistake to jeopardize your future. You never know what's going on in the background of a video or what someone's saying or how things can get taken out of context nowadays. So I think just be safe rather than sorry. Um, employers do look at this type of stuff. And no, I'm not saying that I'm going to Google Will and every other person in the transfer student community. But if I'm maybe trying to find Will's LinkedIn, the first place I'm going to go is probably look him up on Google and then type LinkedIn to follow. And when I type in Will's name underneath it, his Instagram may pop up and then his Twitter and his Facebook. And so no, I'm, am I not going to like explore those, but you never know when something can pop up and shoot yourself in the foot for that future opportunity that you want. So just be aware of that. Google yourself. It really can help you kind of also understand how much information is out there on you and then follow companies too, because that's a great way to gain insight and really allow yourself to stand out. So when you connect, you have something specific to highlight that maybe you saw on Instagram. As we talk about LinkedIn and these professional details. So update those LinkedIn accounts. 
Um, make sure that you have previous imp um, employment on there, previous and current involvement, any accolades you've had, certifications, awards, honors. Um, we all have mobile devices today that have incredible cameras on them. So hashtag portrait mode. Let's get those headshots up there um, and let's keep it professional. It shouldn't be us at a party with our friends taking a headshot. Those email signatures. Um, I think one of the biggest mistakes I see early on in our careers is we're like, ah, I don't have any leadership experience or any professional experience to put in this signature. Many of us do, and it highlight those types of things. Even if it's student involvement and you're part of an exec board, or you hold a chair position in your social fraternity or sorority or whatever the organization may be, put that in your um, email signature because it gives you a little validity for that professionalism and helps shows that you have additional involvement on campus aside from just being a student. And then that professional email name, we talked about how I have the email soccer kid one, two, three. Let's just update those to our current, maybe first name, last name, if you have to throw a number in there, throw a number in there. But most of the time we can get away with the first name, last name. So let's say we connected with some professionals on, um, we're connected with some professionals on LinkedIn. What are some ways that we can stand out? So I wanted to leave three different scenarios. Um, the first being maybe we met Mike in person at a dinner or some sort of event. Um, that we were at through friends and family or that matter. We message Mike on LinkedIn when we connect. When you go through the computer, when you connect with someone, you can add a note. And this would be a little short message in that note section. Hi, Mike. Great meeting you at Greg's anniversary dinner yesterday. I hope you enjoy your time at Parents Weekend in Utah. Let's grab lunch when you're back. I'd like to hear more about your opinions on the upcoming acquisition. So for those of you that's on the call, what makes this a standout message and why would this leave a positive impression to Mike? Um, I think it shows that you were paying attention to what's going on in his life. You're able to bring in specifics to say, oh, not just, oh, it was nice to meet you, but it was nice to meet you where I met you. Um, it shows that you were paying attention and that you kind of just like caught on to details of what he's doing. Absolutely. Like perfectly said, Kayla, you hit a couple things. It showed that you were listening, showed that your, your attention to detail, it was something unique that's going to help you stand out. And you're able to make that connection. So for an example, like let's say a networking event like this, um, if we maybe I connected with 15 students, if I have a message from all students saying like, hey, great connecting with you at the event, just wanted to follow up. That's a way for you to stand out. And you really pulled out specifics of that conversation that you had with either myself or in this example that I had with Mike. For in a networking event like this, maybe it was, hi, Mike, it was great connecting with you at the networking event last week. Um, let me know if you're interested or if you're available to grab coffee. I'd like to learn more about the opportunities your company offers and your experiences. So still a great message to follow up with at a networking event that we are at and able to make it specific too. So that's a lot of what we're looking for. And now maybe on that last example, we've never connected with Mike in the past. So hi, Mike, I'm very interested in your family oriented culture and sales careers at Gallo. Do you have time to meet within the next two weeks? I'd like to learn more about your experience throughout your 22 years. So again, keeping things specific, you could find all that information on within five minutes of just Googling Gallo. You could find that by just pulling up Mike's LinkedIn and see that when you pull up his account to connect with him, that he's been there for 22 years. So again, making that personalized connection is really going to help you sell yourself and stand out. And that's really what this is all about with professional networking and interviewing is selling yourself. So prior to getting to that interview, Maybe it's us preparing for a career fair. Maybe it's us preparing for a networking event. You got to have your elevator pitch down. Uh, this is your opportunity to sell yourself. Um, humility is great. And a lot of people want to see humility in your experiences and how you can express humility in your work. But I would also say that like, be careful of that fine line that you don't want to be too humble to where you're downplaying your experiences or downplaying what you can add to the table. Um, this elevator pitch should be a quick introduction, our name, our college, when we're graduating, what we're going to school for, what are you seeking? So oftentimes, um, I think that's where I find the biggest gap with um, either students following up with me on LinkedIn or connecting in person is I don't know what they're looking for specifically. Are you looking for an internship? Are you looking for a full-time post-grad opportunity? Or are you looking for just information? So just be specific with that. Um, your experiences, so currently where you're working or what you're involved in on campus, but then also how has that experience helped develop you in your professional career? What skills did you gain from that and how can they benefit the organization? That brings us to the bullet point of highlighting those transferable skills. How can those skills that you have be applied to the role? Um, doing research on what are they looking for and you can even tailor your elevator pitch to the skills that the organization is looking for specifically. 
by writing this type of stuff down, you can really eliminate redundancies and kind of get rid of the extra wordiness because this should really be no more than 30 seconds. You want it concise, you want it impactful, and you want it straight to the point. We've talked about being able to stand out and being unique. So anytime we can grab an attention getter, um, whether it's with an interesting fact, a stat, a really big accomplishment that not many other people may have, utilize that because we're trying to stand out and be unique in this type of instance. And practice makes perfect. I know it's so cliche. I could say this until I'm blue in the face, but you've got to practice your elevator pitches. Even if it's three or four times and you're just doing it in the mirror, right before the career fair, like those few little times of practice will help you work through the bumps and really help you feel more confident and be able to articulate yourself in a more clear fashion. When we think about athletes, I like to use this example because when we think about athletes, they create a plan for the season, they prepare for the season, and when the game time comes, they step on the field and they're ready to perform. And you should look at your career in the same fashion. We should be having a plan in line now. So if we're unsure of what industry, schedule those informational interviews. Learn more about yourself through self-assessments. Do research on the different organizations. You wanna be able to prepare, so edit your resume. Ask for resume feedback from each other. Lean in on your career centers. They are there to help you. They're still working through COVID. We're still all here virtually. So lean in on them to help you. There's a lot of different resources from Career Center to also YouTube, LinkedIn Learning. Utilize those types of resources to develop your skills and being able to prepare for the time when the time comes. Practice those mock interview skills with peers of yours and then practice that elevator pitch. So when the time comes, you are ready to perform. Um, when that moment comes, I think be productive in that moment. You want to be concise. You're trying to sell yourself. So don't lose sight of that goal. Set goals for yourself so you have things to work towards leading up to that opportunity. And even though you're not performing in an interview, you still are performing because you are trying to make yourself stand out. Um, you want to show that you are the best fit candidate for this opportunity that you are applying for. And so that performance comes sometimes with even just that good attitude seeming interested, seeming excited. That can make all the difference in the world sometimes because a lot of skills can be taught, but we can't necessarily teach you how to have good work ethic or a good attitude or stay positive. And what a perfect transition, um, selling yourself. Oftentimes I hear students start those elevator pitches with, hi, my name's so-and-so, I'm going to school for this, blah, 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 X, Y, Z. I don't have sales experience, but, or I don't know much about wine, but. What is the disadvantage to the student by starting their elevator pitch with a phrase saying, I don't have sales, I don't know much about? It immediately shows your, well, for lack of a better word, weakness. Okay, yeah, absolutely, Laura. So we're immediately highlighting something that is maybe one of our areas that we're trying to work on, um, or maybe a skill that we're trying to develop. And I think really the moral of the story here is we all have skills that can't be taught, whether it's that positive attitude, whether it's effective communication, strong work ethic, persistence, self-motivation, goal-oriented. These are all skills that are extremely, extremely hard to teach people, and some can't even be taught. And so lean in on those skills that can't be taught, because a lot of organizations have training and development in place to work on those skills that can be taught. When you're talking about your experiences, it's less of what you did and more of what you learned, um, especially for some of those more traditional roles like working in retail or working in a restaurant. A lot of employers or recruiters have an idea of like what that role entails. So think about it from a perspective of what did you take away from that experience? Um, not I bust 10 tables a night or I served 40 different customers in the evening, but um, effectively developed communication skills to manage six tables at one time. So develop your multitasking and effective communication skills. What did you learn from that experience? And then work experience isn't necessarily always key. So um, you may have a job experience that in the past you may say, uh, this was not for me at all. It's not relevant to this specific profession. So I'm going to just drop it off my resume completely. And then maybe there's a gap in your work history. Some of the times that work experience for that specific role not, may not be specific to the industry, but it's what you learn. And so work experience isn't always key. It's what you can take away from those situations. As we pursue those career uh, recruiters at career fairs or via LinkedIn, whatever it may be, we need to remember that we're more than a piece of paper. We're a person behind it. And I know that sounds kind of funny to say, but we have a whole personality that makes you, you unique and you want to be able to showcase that too. And so a resume or a LinkedIn gives a good frame of reference of who we are, but it doesn't define who we are. And you need to remember that when connecting and trying to sell yourself. 
So asking those questions of what makes a successful candidate, finding opportunities to connect with more than just that one person, to connect with the rest of the team. When are they gonna be back on campus virtually? And then following up too, it's doing all those little things right that make all the difference on the long term. And so being able to follow up that same day, connect on LinkedIn, or even send that email or a handwritten letter, those are all ways that you're gonna help sell yourself and have the ability to be that unique candidate in that pool of 100 or 200 or however many it is. So I wanna leave some best practices on how to not market or how to not sell yourself. Um, the first one is watch those social media postings. Um, we've all been there. We've had the night where we woke up, we had a posting, we're like, oh, that was probably not one that I wanted on my Instagram or my Twitter post. And you take it down right away, but you never know when things can be taken out of context. So just remember that. Um, those unique resume submissions. Um, I put a little uh, meme at the beginning in Mean Girls. She turns in a homework assignment to her professor. And he says, oh, it's pink. And she says, yeah, and it's scented too. Be clear with the resume. Like, let's keep this professional. Yes, we want to be unique, but our resume should not be that place to be unique. Um, the experience is, could be unique, but not the way that we're doing spelling, like texting or shorthand. Um, not the way that we're using photos or videos on it. If maybe you're in a creative profession, maybe that's an attachment that you add as an addition to your resume, but don't let that take away from the resume. And then keep it black and white, straight to the point. Don't get too crazy with the colors or the layouts. Um, there's a lot of great structured resumes out there. I think just don't overcomplicate it. Um, one of the things that I see people do early in their careers too is maybe you attend an info session or a meeting with a, um, a professional and you just don't come off as interested. You need to appear interested throughout and that's gonna help you stand out. Dressing inappropriately, you could have the best interview, but if I have someone that shows up to an interview in sandals, shorts, and a t-shirt, I'm not moving them to the next round because they can't even take the extra little bit of time to come professional and prepared to this interview. So why, is I, why as a recruiter would I want to give them my stamp of approval and then pass on over to our leadership team to follow? So think about those types of things. Um, appearing uninformed. All it takes is 10, 15 minutes with Google to go and learn a little bit more about an organization. So put that little bit of time in before to get familiar. You don't need to know all the ins and outs, but a little bit goes a long way. If you don't provide specific example of your experiences and your growth, or you don't ask good questions, these are all going to be ways to kind of shoot yourself in the foot and really hinder those opportunities for you in the future. So as we look to preparing for those career fairs or how to sell yourself, um, we're going to need to do some research on some organizations. So what are some, what are some areas that we can do research about um, but what are some, let me rephrase this. What are some ways that we can be doing research prior to a career fair or connecting with an employer? What are some areas that we can be doing research on? You can research the company or people, like their experiences, like Excellent. those working in the company and like what they've done. Yeah, thank you. So the company, the interviewers, um, great. Well, that took out two of the three major categories, the industry too. So those are three great ways to get your foot in the door and really establish some rapport and build some connection early on with the interviewer. Do a little research on the company. Are they public or private? Um, what does their leadership opportunities look like? And what's going on in maybe recent news or acquisitions, purchases? What's maybe some recent updates with the organization or innovations? Industry knowledge, so market trends, what competition's doing? Uh, again, like innovations or new emergences into the industry or something that maybe caught your eye so that you have a little insight. More often than not, especially with a lot of these career fairs, you may know who that interviewer is or who that professional is that you're connecting with. So do a little research on LinkedIn, learn about their past involvement or past roles, but also any past interactions that you had with company employees, be able to speak to those when you connect with a maybe a new recruiter. And I'd always say have at least three to four questions prepared for the interview. Um, again, those are going to be things that you can do to help yourself stand out. Um, in terms of attire and etiquette, so I think always dress for one level higher than the position that you want. Um, if it's a business casual type of work, maybe come in a little bit business professional. Um, clothes should be in good condition, well-fitting, wrinkle-free. So I think just the, really the main takeaway from this is I'm not grabbing my collar shirt, shaking it off the wrinkles and putting it on as I go and hop onto the Zoom call. Although it's virtual, we do need to be dressing professionally. Best part is it can be from the waist up, unless you have to get up and go and close your door or do something. I think just be cognizant of that. So I've had instances where I've had to go up and close my door, tell my roommates to quiet down. And so just make sure you're dressed professionally for the occasion if you may have to get up. Um, what to bring a resume. So yes, it's virtual, but I think still be ready to have to send that if you um, have 
if you have to send it, I think just have it accessible and you're not digging through files, have some questions and then come in with that good attitude and seem excited about the opportunity. In terms of interview tips and trips, so how to sell yourself in the interview, pre prepare those typical questions, have an idea of how to answer them, um, research the company before, have those questions prepared. We talked about knowing strengths and weaknesses um, and have specific examples in mind for success, leadership, challenges that you face in work and school. Uh, I think overall, when we think about weaknesses, oftentimes we try to kind of avoid that topic. We don't want to talk about the things that are, aren't our strongest suits. But I think what helps the candidate stand out even more is being able to address what their weaknesses are or what I'd rather call an opportunity and how are they working on that now. If you could highlight something that maybe isn't your strongest area, but you're trying to develop that now, that speaks volumes to who you are as a candidate of being self-aware and also trying to find a solution to an opportunity on how to develop further. Um, you're not going to necessarily always get like, tell me about yourself. What are your strengths? What are your weaknesses? That cut and dry. It may come in a different ways of wording it. So I think just being able to answer these questions will help you with the interview process. Many interviews today are now done behavioral focus. So effective storytelling is really important and using the STAR method is what I tell a lot of students to lean in on. And so it's situation, task, action, result. The idea is our answers should come in the form of a story. Um, and there should always be a beginning, middle, and end. So I think first and foremost, listen to the question. Think about what that question is. Take a couple seconds to kind of process it. Don't give that split answer right away. For the situation, you want to provide a little context or a background. Um, where I see students kind of veer away too much is we focus too long on the background story of the interview question. Don't let that detract from your answer. We wanted to put a little bit of a frame of reference around it, but this should be quick and concise. We shouldn't be talking about stuff that's not relevant to the answer. As we talk about the task, so now really addressing what that problem was or what the question was specifically, whether it was a problem or a challenge or how we worked effectively in teams, what specifically was the task that you were at hand with? What was the action to follow? So what did you specifically do? We solved, I calculated. Um, what were you specifically doing and what was your actions to follow that? And then the results. That's, I think, the big parts that we're always missing in this star is the situation that we put too much context and we forget about the results. So what came to follow? What was the benefits? How did it impact it? The savings, the rewards, the recognition, et cetera. How did you deal with that conflict and what was the result? What did you learn from that? Again, think about it in the sense of a story. There should always be a beginning, middle, and end. And then I wanted to leave you all with just some virtual interview tips and tricks on how to really sell yourself virtually. First and foremost, look at the camera and not the screen. I think early on, I was really focused on trying to make eye contact with the students or whoever I'm connecting with. And then in realization, I'm not necessarily making eye contact with them. I'm looking at their face on the screen. So by looking in the camera, it looks like I'm directly looking at you all. And that makes it a little bit more impactful. And I think helps sell yourself a little bit better. Dress the part. Again, you can do it from the waist up. We have no problem with that. Uh, but just be aware, if you do have to get up and maybe close that door or turn on a light for better lighting, you don't want that to be the thing that shoots you in the foot again because you have shorts on underneath. Um, prepare your surroundings. So I think just be aware of those elaborate backgrounds. You can use the virtual backgrounds. You just don't want it to be distracting. So if you have a bunch of posters, Christmas lights, whatever it may be on your walls, just be aware of those types of things when you're going into the interview. Keep the profiles professional. Just switch back your information. Um, when you do come back from having those Zoom meetings with friends, you don't want that to be the thing that hinders the opportunity. We talked about practice. I can't say it enough, and it is so cliche. And when I was in your shoes, I was like, whatever, practice, practice, whatever. Practice your interviews. Practice those elevator pitches. It makes all the difference. If I can have you walk away with any one piece of advice that you remember today, it's practice this professional development and career planning because this is just as important as any other thing in your life. Um, close out those other programs. We all have our devices that are connected to our laptop and our Apple Watch and everything else. So just mute all those other applications. Um, as we talk about virtual interview, unique perspective because you can use notes now. Um, you can have a little quick notepad in front of you with some things to jog your memory, but don't rely too much on those notes or let that detract from what you're doing um, or interviewing specifically. I would say just write like one or two little words that are going to help remind you of maybe that experience or something that you wanted to highlight. You just don't want it to look like you're reading from your paper the whole time. Avoid those interruptions. Let your roommates know. Let your parents know. 
Uh, put the pets in the other room if you have to and you can. Um, just be aware of those background noises. You don't want that to take away from your interview. It is your time to be the main focus point. So let that be the focus point. Watch your body language. Um, at home, it's easy to kind of like be off in the side of the camera or be slouching or just like have like half of our face showing on the Zoom. Sit up, seem interested, lean into the camera a little bit if you have to. Um, just, I think, set up a good surrounding for you so that you can be aware of these things and don't kind of lose track of your arms. We oftentimes use our hands to help present too, so just don't let that take away from it. Um, avoid those, can you hear me now? So just get on early, test the audio, test the video. Make sure the interviewer is engaged. The, I would just say if you're doing all of these other bullet points and keeping these all in mind, you're going to keep the interviewer engaged. And then follow up. Follow up's really key. Um, in terms of business etiquette, write a thank you note, send an email, use spell check. Um, I don't have any problem with students kind of taking a template as a follow up and saying thank you for XYZ and then putting in something that makes it a little unique. But I have had instances where it's not my name on the top of that email, it's someone else's name. And that is going to hurt it right away. So just pay attention to those little things. Always proofread it. Um, try to do it within the first 24 hours. Make it personalized. Mention something specific. Um, and just be appreciative of their time and show that you value that time too. And you're going to be able to rock it all. Um, for those that would like to connect with my team and stay connected on a summer sales internship, connect for our full-time postgrad opportunities or just connect for future opportunities down the line, if you guys grab your cell phones and scan this QR code, that is a way for me to send some email reminders about our application. Um, I'm gonna briefly overview who we are as a company real quick, um, and then kind of walk through a little bit about our opportunities for you all. Um, if I'll click back, does anyone need this QR code real quick? I see Kayla scanning real quick, so I'll give him a second. All good? Cool. Awesome. Um, so a little bit about who Gallo is real quick. So Ian J. Gallo Weiner, we were founded by Ernest and Julio Gallo in 1933. So Ernest and Julio Gallo come from an immigrant Italian family. They landed in Modesto, California, which in the 30s and even today, there's not too much around it. So a lot of opportunity for agriculture, specifically in wine. Um, Ernest would be the brother in charge of sales and marketing and Julio would oversee that winemaking. And so Ernest was going to be the one that pushed his brother saying that he could sell more wine than Julio can make. And Julio said, no way I can make more wine than you can sell. Well, that competitive nature really fostered a lot of growth in the organization. And now today we're the largest family owned and operated winery in the entire world. Um, in terms of U.S. sales, we're responsible for one in four bottles of all wine sold in the United States as a Gallo bottle of wine. Um, I'll say that one more time. One in four bottles of wine sold in the United States is a Gallo bottle of wine. So we own 25% of the wine category, um, a lot of opportunities for our organization because we were vertically integrated, which I'll get to on the next slide. And we're actually on a fourth generation family members running the organization. So still family owned, still privately held, and really looking out for those family cultures and values in the best interest of our employees. And that's what keeps a lot of people here with Gallo 20, 25 years. In terms of being vertically integrated, so we do everything in-house from growing our grapes to making our own wines to making our own spirits. We bottle, we have marketing, research, everything is done in-house, and we even make all of our own glass bottles and our own glass plant and sell a large portion of them to our competitors. Um, we're responsible for 30% of all the recycled glass in California because we take in so much of it and melt it down and use it in our glass plant. So what this is, sl slide is basically showing is there is a lot of career opportunities with our company in Gallo. Um, if you're not interested in sales, you can go to gallocareers.com and we have a lot of other functions available there but I'll be here to talk about some of those sales roles. So our full-time post-grad program, this is for graduating seniors, either graduating this December or graduating over the, um, in May and spring, you can apply either semester, um, but I encourage you to apply early on. Here's that QR code for anyone that may need it again. We break down our phases and our program into three phases. All the sales that we do are done business to business. There's no cold calling. It's selling in all pre-established accounts. And we do all of this face-to-face. -face. So it's outside sales going to these stores. You are not working out of an office and stuck behind a computer screen. So if you were going crazy from all this Zoom fatigue and being stuck in virtual classes, this is a great opportunity for you. Um, you're really gonna focus on taking over a set of pre-established accounts. So 15 to 30 grocery stores and drug stores that sell Gallows Wine and Spirits. And your role is to step into this route. You get full ownership, a lot of autonomy in this role and you get to run the business across these 15 to 30 stores with Gallo's partnership with these stores. 
We have a lot of training and development to get you comfortable with wine, to get you comfortable with spirits, sales, everything in between. Um, and so we're really going to focus on a lot of training and development in this first phase. You're going to learn a lot about the wine and spirit industry. You're going to learn a lot about sales, but most importantly, you're going to learn how to build these business relationships and what is the importance of building them face to face. After you kind of become an expert of that first sales representative role, you then get to be promoted to a district manager. <clears throat> Here you're going to develop as a sales leader. So really understanding how to manage a team of six to eight sales reps. You're going to focus on a lot of coaching, training, motivating, um, and learning how to drive results through other. And that's a really fun role because a lot of the recruiting that we do is from college recruiting. So you're talking students starting their career now right out of college. And they're really excited for that next opportunity. And it's a lot of fun to be able to work with that team. Um, and then on those various opportunities, you saw our vertical integration of all the different departments that we cover. And you can really grow into any of those divisions that you're interested in. Uh, but to list a couple of them, you can go into restaurants, bars, and hotels, sales management, HR, specialty roles, finance, um, recruiting, marketing. There's a lot of different opportunities here with Gallo. And sales is a great track to get you started and have a lot of transferable skills in any area that you work with in the organization. And then for our internship. So um, our internship is an eight week paid internship based out of Southern California. Um, the awesome part about this is, is it's very fast paced. It's very dynamic and no two days are the same. So you get to work with a different sales professional every day from sales representatives to district managers to different divisions like marketing, finance, analytics, um, our leadership team all the way up to VP. So you get full line of sight into where a career can start at Gallo and where you can be 25 years down the line. You're gonna learn a lot about business to business sales and what does that look like? What does working in the wine and spirits industry look like? I will tell you, it is a lot of fun being able to work with wine and spirits each and every day. Um, you get to kind of take all these learnings and apply it to a project um, and really be able to reflect to our leadership team about everything that you learned. And you learn a lot about the industry through that. You must be 21 by the start of the internship um, that is because we do get you involved with a lot of tastings and you get to play a key role in a lot of the decisions. So that is part of the reason why you have to be 21. So as long as you're 21 by June, 2021, you're good to go. Graduating by 2022, unfortunately we don't offer sponsorship. So, um, you must have permanent legal rights to work in the U S and then we do ask that you provide your own vehicle for the internship, but we do reimburse you for all business related driving that you do. So every mile that you do, we reimburse you for all that. And these positions are posted on Handshake and Connect SC. So feel free to look up both of those. They are live until Tuesday, October 20th. Fall 2020 Sales Internship Program and Fall 2020 Sales Leadership Development Program. That's all you're going to look up on either Connect SC or Handshake. Um, if you'd like to follow our Instagram, here's another QR code. You can see that we love our QR codes here at Gallo this semester. Um, so go ahead and scan that. And then I will pull up the last QR code for a little email reminder about those applications, if that's something you're interested in now. Um, and I'll be sending about two or three emails over the next couple of weeks as we lead up to that application deadline. And then I'm happy to answer any questions from any of you. So um, if you guys have questions, feel free to ask. If you want to follow up and just add me on LinkedIn, my name is Gino DeRose, um, D-E-R-O-S-E, -E, and you can add me on LinkedIn um, and follow up there if you don't have any questions now. But thank you all for being here in a late evening. We appreciate it. Thank you, Gina. That was an awesome presentation. Yeah, thanks, Will. I appreciate all of the help. Any questions from anyone at all? It can either be about our opportunities, professional development, literally anything I can be a resource for. I had a specific question about the uh, work authorization. Um, so I'm an international student, Gino, and okay. once we graduate, we actually get uh, up to... 12 months of work placement after we finish in a field related to our major. Okay. Um, that when you say sponsorship, I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the H1B visa specifically. Yeah. And even um, like CPT OPT, we don't honor either just because typically our internship would then translate to full-time opportunities to follow. And we wouldn't have that opportunity to sponsor you unless you had permanent legal rights to work here. Gotcha. Uh, you're talking about once that OPT period is over, obviously you'd want us to stay on and depending on, you know, given that you're not guaranteed to stay after the OPT, that's sort of why you guys don't do it. Yeah. That's kind of the issue that we run into, unfortunately. Gotcha. Okay. That's fair enough. Sorry about that. No, that's, that's, that's fine. Um, another question I did have though, and it wasn't more of a question, but I know that 
um, you sort of touched on it before in terms of people undersign themselves about not knowing uh, anything about wine. I, uh, I come from um, my family business is in food. So similar, similar sort of industry in terms of, um, I guess, uh, I guess food production. I mean, wine production, raw, raw ingredients. Uh, and I know people can sometimes undervalue uh, these sort of primary industries just because they're not sexy, right? Everyone wants to work for the big tech companies and whatnot. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I guess a point that I would at least like to make to people that are sort of, cons- you know, considering or, or a bit doubtful of whether they should uh, enter this industry. Let me tell you this, people always need to eat and people always need to drink. So wine and, and, and have a good time. And I think wine, wine sort of hits two of those, two of those aspects. Yeah. Um, so yeah, if anyone that's hesitant about joining, uh, like you said, I think uh, the fact that you guys represent a quarter of the market and the fact that you're in, a, in, in, in an industry that, uh, is not exactly going to die out anytime soon. I think it's a, a valuable thing to, to consider. And that's one of the things too, Will, like to kind of tie it into like current state of the environment today, like what has happened with COVID. As we look at our business, our sales from just retail is up 15% over the year. Um, and as we look about going into our busiest season of the year, we do a third of our business in October, November, December, which is crazy to think about, but it's just because there's so many holidays. And so to be up 15% going into that holiday season with already owning 25% share of the category is unheard of, to be quite frank. Um, As we look at our e-commerce division of like Drizzly and all these delivery services, we're up 400% on the year because of all of these opportunities. So when you really are looking for career stability, when you're looking for something that can be enjoyable and social and being able to work in teams like Wine and Spirits, and food and beverage can offer you that. You said it best. People are always going to be drinking. People are always going to be eating. Sometimes they eat a lot more and drink a lot more when they're happy. Sometimes they eat and drink a lot more when they're sad. If you're me, you're eating and drinking a lot all the time. And so there's always going to be an industry for that too. And I think that's something to always look at too. And I think a lot of people have had these realizations as COVID has impacted a lot of businesses. And we're fortunate to say we haven't had to lay off a single employee due to COVID. And it's awesome to be able to have that stability behind you, knowing that you have a job and you have a roof over your head each day. And that's oftentimes a lot of what matters most. For sure. Any other questions? I just have one question. Um, what was your last name? I'm trying to add you on no, LinkedIn. No, um, it's the Rose. Let me here. Let me send you in the chat. I will just grab okay, the link perfect. and I will send my email in here as well. Um, here is my email and I will send the link to my LinkedIn, but yes, please feel free to connect. Um, and thank you. Yeah, because I'm a sophomore and like I obviously like I'm not a junior yet, but I definitely want to, you know, browse some future opportunities with you guys. Yeah, totally. And I think like the best way to set yourself up for the future is like getting connected with the team now. So when those opportunities do come and you're eligible at that junior year, like you've already met three, four employees. Maybe there's some new people involved with recruiting. You can connect with new people. You have a lot of insight too. So always happy to connect and talk more about that. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Thanks for being here. And, and Gina, I'm about to get my Italian citizenship. Are you guys thinking about expanding uh, channels into the European markets? We are already in the international markets. Well, we already beat you to the punch. Um, yeah, we have international teams. We have an EU BU um, business unit. We have a Latin Americas and Central Americas, South America, Asia, um, and then I believe Oceanic as well. We cover the entire globe, honestly, and we have wines coming from all over some properties um, in Australia, some properties in New Zealand. So we're scattered amongst. Nice. I'm glad to hear it. Any last questions for anyone? Thank you guys for being here. It's late. It's a Tuesday night. You guys got classes. So I just appreciate you guys hopping on the call. Really do. No, and likewise, thank you for coming. Of course. Kayla, Rihanna, Haley, you guys got any questions? Thank you so much. It was really cool. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for being here. I have one, sorry, Kyle. Sorry, um, this is more of a general question, I guess. I was just curious if you had any tips for having a, I guess, successful LinkedIn profile when you haven't, like I, I have to make one, but um, just any tips to having one that stands out or anything like that. Um, I think like the only experiences I really have are working retail. So okay. I'm, just, I'm like, it's not a, it's nothing big and crazy like an internship, but I'm just trying to figure out how I could 
I guess, highlight that in the best way possible. Yeah, totally. I think some of the best jobs you can have in life are those unglamorous jobs that like have the like biggest misconceptions from the outside, like being a dishwasher or a busser in the rest in a restaurant, being a server, working in retail, like these teach you hard work. They teach you grit. They teach you persistence. Um, retail teaches you how to effectively communicate with customers, how to manage multiple responsibilities at once. And so I think there's always ways to highlight your experiences and like what you took away from it. So what I would say is if your experiences that you have aren't necessarily like what is going to sell you, it should be what you learn from them that is going to sell you then too. So think about it from that perspective of, yeah, maybe a retail experience, but like how did you learn sales in that instance and how can you apply it to a future opportunity potentially in sales? How did you learn how to work with customers or solve a problem for a customer that comes into your account? Um, communicating with people from all different walks of life, all those types of skills can be transferable into any industry. And then I would say get involved on campus, like join clubs, join organizations, especially in these virtual settings. Like you have an awesome opportunity to go and connect with a lot of organizations and some of them aren't even charging membership this semester or next semester. So a great way for you to learn more about like, what are you interested in? Thank you. Yeah. And Gina, I'd, I'd one more question. I think yeah. that people would want to know, what do you guys look for specifically in an applicant? Is it, I know you touched on it before that motivation, that grit, mm -hmm. but I, I guess a better question, like what do you feel makes the best uh, sales employee in your organization? Totally. Um, great question. So I think first and foremost, like leadership is going to be key. So like, what are you doing to develop that leadership now? Whether it's work leadership, whether it's volunteer work, club involvement, student organizations, leadership is going to make a, a big impact. Um, and then within a sales organization, a lot of that comes down to the personality. Um, I can't come and teach a student like good work ethic. That is who you are as a person. So being able to like reflect or not reflect, but demonstrate and show that you have good work ethic is key. Um, Got to have grit. Got to not be afraid to come in and do the hard work and get the job done. Um, adaptability. I mean, when you talk about our environment that we live in today, like nothing is predictable. Like tomorrow's not guaranteed and you got to be adaptable to always changing environments. So being able to reflect positively on that. Um, and then I would just say perseverance too. like working in sales, you're going to get told no. Sometimes you get told no eight times in a day. And yeah, it sucks. Like no one wants to get told no ever in their life, but you learn more from oftentimes those failures or when that you fell flat on your face in that sales pitch. And it's really, how do you learn from that experience and then continue to develop and not take it personally and continue to drive forward in your business. Those are a lot of the skills that we have. And for anyone that is interested in joining our team or being a part of our internship, I really encourage you to connect with us. That's a great way to set yourself up for success in an interview or any connection is just making that connection prior to actually applying. For sure. And I mean, just looking at from like the interview perspective too, like you said, in terms of resilience, I think it, a lot of it is you've got to do the job before you get the job. Um, so yeah, another point would be if you don't happen to get the internship opportunity uh, and you want to go into sales, just remember that that's what sales is going to be like. So not to be too discouraged for the next, the next time. Yeah. And last little plug before I let you guys all go, I'd also say like our internship is only three to six students in Southern California across like 14 campuses every summer. So it's an extremely, extremely small internship. Our sales team covers every grocery store, every drug store, every liquor store, convenience store from Santa Barbara down to San Diego. There's a lot in that window. So when you think about opportunities for full-time post-grad, there are a lot of territories that we look to fill each year, each semester. So there's a lot more full-time opportunities than there are internships. So if anyone is interested in the internship, you apply. If you don't get it, don't feel discouraged, please, to come back full time. We have a lot more of those opportunities too. For sure. Don't close any doors. And how many people uh, apply normally for the internship? Do you know how competitive is it? Um, across my six campuses, I usually have like roughly two to 300 applicants total. Um, there's two of us. So I'd say probably each semester anywhere from four, 450 to 600 applicants, I'd say total. Yeah. So get in while you can, guys. Yeah. Wait, and you only choose 12 or 14? Um, like total? Three to six. 14 campuses we recruit at. Three to six oh. total for the internship. Yeah. Oh, nice. Okay. 
That's well, and that's not thirty six. That is literally the number three. <laughs> three to six. Three to Got it. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. awesome. Well, well, Gino, thank you so much. Of course, I'll stop sharing my screen. Um, thank you, Will, for putting this all on. Thank you all for being here. For those of you that couldn't make it tonight, thank you for watching the video and hopping on. Hopefully some of this stuff can help you. Feel free to always reach out to myself and the Gallo team. We're always here to support. And uh, best of luck to all of you this semester and uh, stay healthy and safe. Yeah, thank and you. fight on. Yes, fight on. Thanks, everyone. Of course. Thank you. Have a good night.